This is from Volume 3 of Maria Valtorta, and Chapter 369, entitled the, the Thursday Before Passover, in Joanna of Chusa's house. The scene picks up where uh, Philip, one of Jesus' apostles, finds out that his daughter wants to become consecrated to the um, religious life. Mother, my wife has spoken in a queer way. What happened? Why did she say that she is crippled and crowned at the same time? asks Philip, who is anxious to know. Mary smiles kindly, looking at him, and although she is averse to famili familiarities, <clears throat> she takes his hand, saying, Would you be able to give my Jesus what is dearest to you? You really ought to, because he gives you heaven and the way to get there. Of course I would, mother, particularly if what I gave him would make him happy. It would, Philip. Your daughter also is consecrating herself to the Lord. She told me, and her mother, a little while ago, in the presence of many women disciples. What? You? explains Philip, dumbfounded, pointing his finger at the gentle girl, who clings to Mary as if she wished to be protected. The apostle swallows with difficulty this second blow that deprives him for good for the, of the hope of having grandchildren. He wipes the sudden flow of perspiration caused by the news, and looks at the people around him. He is struggling and suffering. His daughter moans, Father, forgive me and bless me, and she throws herself at his feet. Philip caresses her brown hair mechanically and clears his throat. At last he speaks. One forgives children who commit sins. By consecrating yourself to the Master, you are not committing a sin, and your poor father can but say to you, May you be blessed. Ah, my daughter, how sweet and terrible is the will of God. And he bends, lifts his daughter, embraces her, kissing her forehead and hair. He then moves towards Jesus and says to him, Here, I am her father, but you are her God. Your right is stronger than mine. Thank you, Lord, for the joy that... And he cannot go on. He kneels at Jesus' feet and bends to kiss them, moaning, No grandchildren, never, my dream, the smile of my old age. Forgive my tears, my Lord. I am a poor man. Stand up, my dear friend, and be happy because you are giving the early flowers the angelical flower beds. Come, come here between me and my mother. Let us hear from her how this happened, because I can assure you that I, that I am neither to be blamed or praised for it. Mary explains, I know very little myself. We women were speaking to one another, as, as is often the case. They were asking me about my virginal vow. They were asking me what future virgins will be like, which work and which glory I foresaw for them. And I was replying as best as I could and I foresaw for them a life of prayer and a relief to the suffering caused to my Jesus by the world. I said, it will be the virgins who will support the apostles, and will purify the foul world, clothing and scenting it with their purity. They will be the angels singing praises to cover up the blasphemy of the world. And Jesus will be happy, and will grant graces to the world, and will have mercy on it. Thanks to these lambs spread among wolves, and I was saying other things, Jairus' daughter then said to me, Give me a name, mother, for my future as a virgin, because I cannot allow any man to have pleasure out of my body, which was revived by Jesus. This body of mine belongs to him only until its flesh will be in the grave and its soul in heaven. And Analia said, That is what I also felt I should do, and now I feel happier than a swallow, because all ties are broken. It was then that your daughter, Philip, said, uh, it was then that your daughter, Philip, said, I will be like you too, a virgin forever. Her mother, there she is coming, pointed out to her that one cannot take such a decision just like that, but she would not change her mind, and when she was asked whether it was an old idea, she had replied, no, and to those who asked her how she got it, she said, I do not know. It was as if a beam of light had pierced my heart, and I understood of what love I love Jesus. Philip's, Philip's wife asks him, have you heard that? Yes, woman. Our flesh groans, whereas it should rejoice, because this is its glorification. Our heavy flesh has procreated two angels. Do not weep, woman. You said yourself that he has crowned you. A queen does not weep when she receives her crown. But Philip is weeping as well, and many more. Both men and women are weeping, now that they are all gathered on the terrace. Mary of Simon has burst into unrestrained weeping in a corner. Mary of Magdala is weeping in another corner pulling and twisting her linen dress from which she mechanically tears off the threads, trimming the hem. 
Anastasika is weeping, and she tries to conceal her sorrowful face with her hand. Why are you weeping? asks Jesus. No one replies. Jesus calls Anastasika and asks her once again. She replies, Because, Lord, for the nauseating pleasure of one night only, I lost the possibility of being one of your virgins. Every condition is good if one serves the Lord in it. In the future, church, both virgins and matrons will be required. They are both useful for the triumph of the kingdom of God in the world and for the work of their brother priests. Eliza of Bethzer, come here, comfort this very young woman. And with his own hands, he places Anastasica between Eliza's arms. He watches them while Eliza caresses Anastasica, who relaxes in her motherly arms. And he then asks Eliza, Do you know her story? Yes, Lord, I do. And I feel sorry for her, for she is like a dove without nest. Eliza, do you love this sister? Do I love her? Yes, I do, very much, but not as a sister. She could be my daughter, and now that I am holding her in my arms, I feel as if I were becoming the happy mother of days gone by. To whom are you going to entrust this gentle gazelle? To you, Eliza. To me? The woman unfastens her arms to look at the Lord incredulously. To you? To you. Do you want her? Oh, Lord, my Lord! Eliza crawls on her knees towards Jesus, and she does not know what to say or how to express her joy. Stand up and be a holy mother to her and let her be a holy daughter to you, and may you both proceed in the way of the Lord. Mary of Lazarus, you were so cheerful a little while ago. Why are you weeping now? Where are the ten flowers you were going to bring me? They are replete with food and are sleeping in their purity, Master, and I am weeping because I shall never have the purity of virgins, and my soul will weep forever, without ever being sated, because I have sinned. My forgiveness, my forgiveness and your tears make you purer than they are. Come here and weep no more. Leave tears to those who have something of which they are ashamed. Come on, go and get your flowers, and you may go as well, your mothers and virgins. Go and tell the guests to, of God to come here. We will have to dismiss them before the gate closes, because many of them live out in the country. They all obey and depart, so that on the terrace there are left only Jesus, who is caressing Mary and Matthias, Eliza and Anastasica, who are a little farther off, are holding each other's hands, looking at each other, smiling and weeping for joy. Mary of Simon, Mary of Simon, that is, Judas's mother, over whom Mary bends in pity, and Johanna, who is standing at the door of the room, looking towards Jesus in an uncertain attitude. The apostles and disciples have gone downstairs with the women to help the servants bring up the long staircase, the crippled, blind, lame, and old people bent with age. Jesus raises his head, which was bent over the two children, and sees Mary stooped over Judas's mother. He gets up and goes towards them. He lays his hand on the gray head of Mary of Simon and asks, Why are you weeping, woman? O oh Lord, I gave birth to a demon. No mother in Israel will be as grieved as I am. Mary, another mother, and for the same reason as yours, said to me, and still says those words, Poor mothers. O oh my Lord, is there another man who, like my Judas, is wicked and cruel to you? Oh, it cannot be. He has you, and yet he is addicted to foul practices. Although he lives in your atmosphere, he is lustful and a thief, and he will perhaps become a homicide. He, oh, his mind is deceitful. He lives in agitation. Make him die, Lord. Out of pity, make him die. Mary, your heart makes him worse than he is. Fear is driving you insane, but you must be calm and reasonable. What proof have you of his behavior? I have no proof of anything against you, but it is an avalanche which is about to fall. I caught him, and he could not deny the evidence that here he is. For pity's sake, be quiet. He is looking at me. He suspects. He is my grief. There is no mother in Israel more unhappy than I am. Mary whispers, I am, because I add the sorrows of all unhappy mothers to my own, because my sorrow is caused by the hatred of the whole world, not of one man only. Joanna calls Jesus, and he goes towards her. In the meantime, Judas approaches his mother, who is still being comforted by Mary, and he lashes her. Have you been able to show your frenzy and calumniate me? Are you happy now? Judas, is that how you speak to your mother? asks Mary severely. It is the first time I see her thus. Yes, because I am tired of her persecution. Oh, my son, it is not persecution. It is love. You say that I am ill, but it is you who are ill. You say that I calumniate you, and I listen to your enemies, but you are wronging yourself because you follow and are friendly with wicked people who will ruin you. 
because you are weak, son, and they are aware of your weakness. Listen to your mother. Listen to Ananias, who is old and wise. Judas, have mercy on me. Judas, where are you going, Judas? Judas, who is almost running across the terrace, turns around and shouts, where I am useful and respected. And he rushes down the staircase, while the unhappy mother, leaning over the parapet, shouts to him, Don't go! Don't go! They want to ruin you! Son! My son! Judas has arrived downstairs, where the trees prevent his mother from seeing him. He appears for a moment in an empty space before entering the hall. He is gone. Pride devours him, moans his mother. Let us pray for him, Mary. Let us pray together, the two of us, says the Blessed Virgin, holding the hand of the sad mother of the future deicide. Meanwhile, the guests begin to come up, and Jesus is speaking to Johanna. All right, let them come. It is much better if they have put on Jewish clothes to avoid rousing the prejudices of many people. I will wait for them here. Go and call them. And leaning against the doorpost, he watches the arrival of the guests, whom apostles and disciples of both sexes kindly lead to the tables, according to a prearranged order. In the center, there is a low table for children, parallel to which, on both sides, are all the other tables. And while the blind, lame, crippled, and old people bent with age, and the widows take seats with the stories of their sorrows impressed on their faces, large baskets and, mal and small chests, which have been turned into cradles and look as pretty as flower baskets, are brought in, with the babies of poor mothers sleeping in them. And Mary of Magdala, who is now in better spirits, approaches Jesus, saying, The flowers have arrived. Come and bless them, my Lord. At the same time, Johanna appears at the top of the inside staircase, saying, Master, here are the heathen women disciples. They are seven women, wearing plain dark clothes like those of Jewish women. Each has a veil over her face and a mantle, reaching down to her feet. Two of them are tall and stately. The others are of middle height. But when they take their mantles off, after greeting the Master reverently, Plautina, Lydia, and Valeria are easily recognized, as well as Flavia, the freedwoman who wrote Jesus' words in Lazarus' garden. Then there are three strangers. One of them, who looks as if she were accustomed to giving orders, kneels down, saying to the Lord, And may Rome prostrate itself at your feet with me. One is a buxom matron of about fifty years old. The last one is a girl, who is as slim and beautiful as a wild flower. Although the Roman ladies are dressed like Jewesses, Mary of Magdala recognizes them, and she whispers, Claudia, and looks at her wide open eyes. Looks at her with wide open eyes. It is I. I am tired of hearing his words from other people. Truth and wisdom are to be drawn straight from their source. Do you think that they will recognize us? Valeria asks Mary of Magdala. I do not think so, unless you betray your identities by calling one another by name. In any case, I will put you in a safe place. No, Mary, let them be at the tables serving the beggars. No one will think that patrician ladies are serving the poor and lowest people in the Jewish world, says Jesus. Your sentence is a wise one, Master, because pride is inborn in us, and the humility is the clearest sign of my doctrine. Those who want to follow me must love truth, purity, and humility. They must be charitable to everybody, and heroic in defying the opinion of men and the violence of tyrants. Let us go. Forgive me, Rabbi. This girl is a slave and the daughter of slaves. I ransomed her because she is of Jewish extraction, and Plautina, Plautina is keeping her in her own house. But I wish to offer her to you, because I think that she is the right. I think that it is the right thing to do. Her name is Egla. She belongs to you. Take her, Mary. Later we will decide what to do. Thank you, woman. Jesus goes on the terrace to bless the children. The ladies arouse much curiosity, but, dressed in almost poor garments and combed in Jewish style, they do not awaken suspicion. Jesus goes to the center of the terrace, to the children's table, and he prays, offering the food to the Lord on behalf of everybody. He blesses it and tells them to begin eating. The apostles, disciples, women disciples, and ladies are the servants of the poor, and Jesus sets the example, turning up the wide sleeves of his red tunic and looking after the children with the help of Miriam and of Jairus and John. The mouths of so many undernourished people are very busy, but their eyes are all turned towards the Lord. When it begins to get dark, the large valerium is removed, and servants bring lamps, although they are not yet necessary. Jesus moves about the tables. He encourages everybody with words and with his own help. He passes several times near the two stately ladies, Claudia and Plautina, who humbly break bread for guests who are blind, paralytic, or maimed, or they help them to drink wine. He smiles at his virgins who are looking after the women, and at, uh, and at the mother disciples who kindly assist the unhappy people. He smiles at Mary of Magdala, 
who is doing her very best at, t at the tables of some old men, the most sad of all the tables, as it is full of coughing and trembling people, whose toothless mouths chew food with their gums and slaver. He assists Matthew, who is shaking a child, as a crumb of a cake, which he was sucking and biting with his new teeth, has gone down the wrong way. And he congratulates Chusa, who arrived at the beginning of the meal, and is now carving meat and serving it like an expert waiter. The meal is over. The more colorful faces and the brighter eyes of the poor people clearly show their satisfaction. Jesus bends over an old, trembling man and asks him, What thought is making you smile, Father? I was just thinking that it is not a dream. Up to a little while ago, I thought I was sleeping and dreaming, but now I feel that it is really true. But who makes you so good that you, that, but that you make your disciples so kind? Long live Jesus, he f shouts finally, and all the voices of the poor wretches, and they are hundreds, shout, Long live Jesus! Jesus goes once again towards the center of the terrace, and he opens his arms wide, beckoning to them to be quiet and still. He begins to speak, sitting down with a child on his knees. Yes, long live Jesus, not because I am Jesus, but because Jesus means the love of God, who became flesh and descended among men to be known, and to make known the love that will be the sign of the new era. Long live Jesus, because Jesus means Savior. And I will save you. I will save everybody, rich and poor, children and old people, Israelites and heathens, everybody, provided that you give me your will to be saved. Jesus is for everybody. Not, tr not just for this one or that one. Jesus belongs to everybody. He belongs to all men and is for all men. I am merciful love and sure salvation. What must one do to belong to Jesus and thus be saved? Few things, but great things. Not great in the sense that they are difficult, like things accomplished by kings. They are great because they want man to put new vigor and faith into his life, to do them and to belong to Jesus. Thus, love, humility, faith, resignation, pity, are required. Now, you disciples, what great things have you done today? You may say nothing. We served a meal. No. You have served love. You have humbled yourselves. You have treated as brothers unknown people of all races, without asking them who they are, whether they are healthy or good, and you have done that in the name of the Lord. Perhaps you were expecting great words from me for your education. I made you do great things. We began the day with prayer. We have helped lepers and beggars. We have worshipped the Most High in His house. We have begun brotherly agapes, and we have taken care of pilgrims and poor people. We have served, because to serve for love is to be like me, who am the servant of the servants of God, a servant to the extent of being destroyed by death in order to serve you with salvation. Jesus is interrupted by shouting and shuffling of feet. A group of excited Israelites runs up the staircase. The Roman ladies who are best known that is, Plautina, Claudia, Valeria, and Lydia, withdraw cautiously, covering their faces with their veils. The disturbers rush onto the terrace and seem to be looking for I wonder what. Chusa, who feels offended, faces them and asks, What do you want? Nothing concerning you. We are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, not for you. Here I am. Can you not see me? asks Jesus, putting down the child and standing up imposingly. What are you doing here? You can see yourselves, I am doing what I teach, and I teach what is to be done, to love the poor. What have you been told? We, assured, we heard shouts of sedition, and there is sedition wherever you are, we came to see. There is peace where I am. The shout was, Long live Jesus. Exactly. And both at the temple and at Herod's place, they thought that people were conspiring here against... Against whom? Who is the king of Israel? Neither the temple nor Herod. Rome rules here, and whoever thinks of becoming king where Rome rules must be mad. You say that you are a king. Yes, I am a king, but not of this kingdom. It is too trivial for me. Also the empire is too trivial. I am the kingdom. I am the king of the kingdom of heaven, of the kingdom of love and of the spirit. Go in peace, or you may stay if you wish, and learn how one reaches my kingdom. Here are my subjects, the poor, the unhappy, the oppressed, and the good the humble, the charitable, stay here and join them. But you always feast in splendid houses among beautiful women, and that's enough. You cannot throw out innuendos against the rabbi and insult him in my house. Go out, thunders Chusa. But the slender finger, a figure of a veiled girl, jumps onto the terrace from the inside staircase. She runs as lightly as a butterfly as far as Jesus, 
where she drops her veil and mantle, throwing herself at his feet and trying to kiss them. Salome, shouts Chusa, and other people do likewise. Jesus has withdrawn so vigorously to avoid her contact that his seat turns over, and he takes advantage of the situation to put it between himself and Salome as a partition. His eyes are so phosphorescent and dreadful that they rouse fear in everybody. Salome, smirking impudently, says, Yes, it is I. The acclamation was heard in the palace. Herod has sent word to tell you that he wants to see you, but I have forestalled this mess his messenger. Come with me, Lord. I love you so much, and I am so anxious to have you. I am flesh of Israel, too. Go back to your house. The court is waiting for, your, for you to honor you. This is my court. I do not know any other court or other honors. And with his hand he points at the poor people sitting at the tables. I have, bought you, I have brought you gifts for it. Here are my jewels. I do not want them. Why are you refusing them? Because they are filthy and offered for a filthy purpose. Go away. Salome stands up. She is dumbfounded. She casts a quick glance at the terrible, most pure one, who fulminates her with his arms stretched out and eyes flashing fire. She looks furtively at everybody and sees derision, derision or disgust on everybody's face. The Pharisees are petrified, watching the potent scene. The Roman ladies dare come forward to have a better view. Salome makes a last attempt. You approach even lepers, she says submissively and imploringly. They are diseased. You are a wanton girl. Go away. This last go away is so powerful that Salome picks up her veil and mantle, and stooping and crawling, she goes towards the staircase. Be careful, Lord. She is powerful. She might be harmful to you, whispers Chusa in a low voice. But Jesus replies in a very loud voice, so that everybody and the expelled girl, first of all, may hear. It does not matter. I would rather be killed than be allied with vice. The perspiration of a lewd woman and the gold of a prostitute are poisons of hell. A cowardly alliance with the mighty ones is sinful. I am truth, purity, and redemption, and I will not change. Go, show her out. I will punish the servants who let her in. Do not punish anybody. One only is to be punished, the girl, and she is punished. And she should know, and you all should know, that I am aware of her intentions, which make me sick. Let the snake go back to her hole. The lamb is going back to his gardens. He sits down. He is perspiring. He then says, Johanna, give an offering to each of them so that their life may not be so sad for a few days. What else can I do for you, O children of sorrow? What do you want me to give you? I can read your hearts. Peace and health to the sick ones who can believe. There is a short pause, then a cry, and many stand up completely cured. The Jews who had come to catch him are amazed, and in the general enthusiasm for the miracle and for Jesus' purity, no one pays any attention to them when they go away. Jesus smiles, kissing the children. He then dismisses the guests, but he holds back the widows and speaks to Joanna on their behalf. Joanna takes notes and invites them for the following day. They go away too. Well, the last to go are the old people. The apostles, the disciples of both sexes, and the Roman ladies remain with Jesus, who says, That is how future meetings must be. Words are not needed. Let the evidence of facts speak to spirits and minds. Peace be with you. He goes towards the inside staircase and disappears, followed by Joanna and the others. At the foot of the staircase he meets Judas, who says, Master, do not go to Gethsemane. Your enemies are looking for you there. Well, mother, what do you say now? You accuse me, but if I had not gone, I would not have found out about the snare that has been laid for the master. Let us go to another house. Come to ours, then. Only the friends of God enter Lazarus' house, says Mary of Magdala. Yes, let us go who... Let us... Let those who were at Gethsemane yesterday come to Lazarus' house with his sisters. Tomorrow we will take the necessary measures.